grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy, worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life to the glory of thy holy name amen the almighty and merciful lord grant us absolution and remission of all our sins true repentance amendment of life and the grace and consolation of his holy spirit amen
A reading from the book of Jeremiah. O Lord, you know, remember me and to visit me, and bring down retribution for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance do not take me away. Know that on your account I suffer insult. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name. O Lord, God of hosts, I did not sit in the company of merrymakers, nor did I rejoice. Under the weight of your hand I sat alone, for you had, had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Truly you are to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you turn back, I will take you back, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall serve as my mouth. It is they who will turn to you, not you who will turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. Here endeth the first lesson.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here endeth the second lesson.
A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. <clears throat> and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Here endeth the third lesson. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we all know that love is the basic requirement of our faith, don't we? Love God, love others, and love ourselves. That's about as succinct a description of the Christian life as there ever was. Yet many of us are just plain uncomfortable talking about love. I think it might help if we started to view the Holy Bible as a love story. We're better a collection of love stories revealing what it means to love. In our Old Testament reading today, Jeremiah is not what we sometimes would think of as being in a loving state of mind. His prophesying has failed to save Jerusalem and he is seething with discouragement and self-pity. And so much anger that he even accuses God of being a fraud. Can any of us relate to frustration and disappointment at the circumstances of our world and of our lives? I can. But what does this have to do with love? First, it tells us about God's love. A wounded Jeremiah takes his bitter complaint to God, and God does not reject him. God's love begins by accepting us as we are, where we are, no matter what. Second, this is about 
how we ought to communicate with God. And that is with transparent honesty. We waste precious energy and time dressing up our wounds and putting on a happy face. Do we think that pleases God? I think some of us may be afraid that we can't be our true selves. That if we tell God how we really feel or share with God our real, our real selves, God would surely reject us. That's a fatal mistake. God's unconditional acceptance of us. God unconditionally accepts us. And so we ought to be honest with him. Once we are in communication with God, God draws us into a deeper relationship. Apparently, God's motivation is to change us. The circumstances that cause our pain may be unchanged, as with Jeremiah, but the hold that those circumstances have on us are broken because we are changed. Paul's letter to the Romans teaches us about loving others. Paul says that love must be genuine, it must be real, like the love between God and Jeremiah. But here's the kicker. Paul knows that it's exponentially harder to love people who are altogether different than us or whose words and actions hurt us, trouble us. Hey, I don't need a lot of help loving the people in my life who support me and treat me well and say good things about me. It's everybody else. Those others who are difficult to love for one reason or another. That's who Paul is challenging the Romans and us to love. And it doesn't seem natural to love the difficult other, the hostile other, the enemy. The world's way, the natural way, is to oppose them, to defeat them, or to ignore them. So to love this way is to cut against the natural flow of the world. It takes a decision of the will, bolstered by the Holy Spirit, to enter into that flow of God's love. The key characteristic in Paul's description of love is its distinctive quality of selflessness. This placing of well-being of others above our own is a posture of love that inclines us to humility, nonviolence, and good deeds. This kind of love, the Greek word for it is agape, is very different and more demanding than other kinds of love that we might call to mind or that the world has on offer. Very different. So we need to ask ourselves, is the standard of love that Paul lays out even possible? Can we love our troublesome neighbors? And if so, how? These are the things that we need to discuss. Finally, we come to our gospel story, which reveals the means by which we grow in love. It's called dying to self. And it's how we can love more 
love better, love like Jesus. We need to understand the vivid language of this passage because it is in no way hyperbole, but our actual daily spiritual work. It sounds sort of terrible to die to self, but this is not about self-destruction, it's about regeneration. The cross is the great symbol for love because it represents the necessary killing off of the tendencies in us to be selfish, to hoard, to always want more. The killing off of our insatiable appetite to have it all our way. These impulses in us, this sin is so strong and so destructive to love, says the gospel, that we can't afford to let it run its course. We've got to actively kill it. The cultural anthropologist Rene Girard explains many of our selfish desires and how they work. In our natural state, according to Girard, we want things not for their own sake, but because others want them. Without even consciously registering it, we see what others have or what others value and want, and we come to desire them also. If left to our own devices, we humans automatically, unreasonably, and unconsciously imitate each other's desires until we are held spellbound by them. Consumer advertising depends on this. We know it's true. How is it that all my neighbors drive the same kind of car as I do? And the clothes I wear sure look a lot like my friends, don't they? If imitative desire is taken far enough, we eventually lose our individual character. This is the kind of life that Jesus calls gaining the whole world, but losing our souls. It's self-obsessed, monochromatic, and banal. It's a lost life. But thanks be to God, because of God's genuine love, we have another way. Whether we call it the way of the cross or the way of love, those things mean the same thing. It's using our reason and will to train our attention on Christ and the cross, to fall in love with Jesus again and again until all that separates us from him is dead. As we do that, Christ reveals our unique beauty. We discover that the adventures in life that bring real transformation, joy, and lasting happiness all come from genuine love. The good news today, my brothers and sisters, is that God's love is genuine and potent. Through the cross, it breaks the spell of all worldly counterfeits, empowering each of us to love God love ourselves, and love each other. The world is, therefore, not all grim, not hopeless. We need to remember that love wins. Just look around at the sacrificial love shown in the ministries and fellowships here in this church, and you'll see people being changed 
by genuine love. These transformed lives are our love stories. And really that's the best and perhaps the only evidence that we have of our faith. So by all means, please, let's keep talking about love.
Good morning. good morning. It's good to be together as the body of Christ, whether we're together here physically right now or virtually, if you're with us on Facebook Live right now, or will be with us on Facebook Live uh, later. Uh, whenever we're gathered together, either uh, at the same time or spread out over time, uh, we've been assured by Jesus that God is in the midst of us. So welcome to all of you here and those of you who are with us online. I'd like to draw uh, your attention to a couple of things in our bulletin. Next Sunday, we'll have a virtual coffee half hour on Zoom hosted by Roy Negro uh, McCraw, thanks to them. Uh, we will be sending out uh, Zoom credentials by Realm. Uh, if you're not on Realm, you can contact the office and they'll give those to you. Uh, and by the way, if you're not on Realm, please sign up for it because it's the easiest, secure way for us to distribute information to you that we don't want distributed uh, throughout the blogosphere, like Zoom uh, credentials and things like that. So if you're not on Zoom, please consider uh, signing up for it. On September 13th, we'll begin a series called Sacred Ground, which is a small group experience. It's limited to 15 people, and it addresses race in America. If you would be interested in that, uh, you can contact Leslie Genewine, who will be facilitating it, or you can contact Father Cannon. Uh, finally, uh, we appreciate your generosity. Your contributions uh, to the church are necessary for us to continue our ministry. Uh, you can even give by text. All you have to do is text SJE to 73256. And you can give without even getting off the couch and getting dressed. So I hope you'll consider uh, supporting the church financially one way or another. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering 
and a sacrifice to God. We pray for those for whom our intercessions have been requested. For Harry, Baker, Mark, Robin, Jackie and family, Bill, Patty, Ansley and family, Nancy, Ray, Colin, Lynn, Tori and family, Astrid, Jeff, Sid, Suzanne, Clark, Suzanne, John, Nancy, Maureen, Michelle, Jonathan, Pat, Jerry, Jean, Betty, Pam, Luke, Julie, Kit, Marcy, and Susan, Jim, Tommy, Jan and family, Ray, we pray for our parish family, the clergy and staff of our parish, our pastoral care ministers, our parish day school, our companion diocese in the Dominican Republic, the members of our armed forces deployed abroad, especially Rich, Mike, and Jake. We pray for ourselves and all those who are suffering the effects of the pandemic and we pray for healthcare workers, first responders, and all others whose work puts them in danger because of the pandemic. 
We give thanks for their many sacrifices for the common good. Protect them from injury and illness. Renew their wisdom, compassion, and strength. We pray for the departed, especially Anne, Malini, Kate, and Jean. May their souls and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. We pray for our own needs and the needs of others. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to thy service and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and has promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.